generated by love. Y'all don't remember when he said, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, I want you to sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. I want you to sweep streets like Beethoven made music. I want you to sweep streets so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper, and he did his job well. Yeah. Gary, if you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, then be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub on the side of the rail. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, be a trail. If you can't be the sun, then be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Y'all don't remember. When it said, if any of you are around, when I have to meet my death, I don't want a long deal. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk to me. And every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. And I'd like somebody to mention on that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to live his life serving others. I want somebody to mention on that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right about the war questions. Y'all don't remember. I want you to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to see that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to be able to see that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to see that day, Bill, that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to see that I was a drum major, see that I was a drum major for justice. I was a drum major for truth. I was a drum major for righteousness, and all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody, and as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word of song, if I can show somebody his traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation in a world who wants wrought, if I could spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right or your left side. Not for any selfish reasons. I want to be on your right or your left side. Not in times of some political kingdom or ambition. I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth. And in commitment to others so that we can make of this own world a new world. Let me close by saying got some difficult days ahead of us, but it really doesn't matter what we know, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind like anybody I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now, and I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Y'all don't hear me. I simply do this because in my lifetime, 
when I go downtown and I look between the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial, I see that in 2006 they dedicated a memorial to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I say, back when we were called colored, when we began to be called Negroes, using a capital N, when we became African Americans, that this country will have to stop and pause and say, here lived among our people a man who stood for something a man who took a stand for his people. He loved us so much that he was willing to die for what he believed in. That is what I hope these young people will find out. They killed the dreamer, but they have not killed the dream. The dream is in them. They are our future. They are the best resource that we have. It is up to us to prepare our young people to be the best that they can be. You looking for a hero? You looking for a shero? Drive downtown. Go look in between the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial and see what we have something to be proud of. A man who looked like us. A man who ate collard greens and fried chicken. A man who stood for just black people to be free. I just ask, do you still believe in the dream? Let me try it again. Do you believe in the dream? Do you think we're going to make it? Do you think that we shall overcome? Do you really believe it? If you believe that we shall overcome, won't you stand? Won't you sing, we shall overcome? We shall overcome someday, oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Y'all can join hands if you want to. Won't you sing it one more time so they can hear you all the way downtown? Come on. Thank you, Brother Kevin. Thank you for all your My dear fellow clergymen, I 
could not sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. <coughs> Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the courts. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. <laughs> For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. I have looked at the South's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. Over and over I found myself asking what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched community. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. We are pleased now to bring out this wonderful gentleman and just sit here and listen to him. You're going to learn so much and you're going to hear some great music from this wonderful choir. Please, we bring out Mr. Kevin McElvain, also known as Frederick Douglass. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
killings, brutal beatings, shameful and shocking attacks on slave women, overwork, underfed, ill-clothed. That was the slave's lot on the eastern shore of Maryland, where slavery was said to be mild. Bring Israel was in a Egypt not a nation on earth guilty of the practices more shocking and bloody than the people of the United States at this very hour. That no man on account of his color, no man on account of his race, no man on account of his conditions is deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That moms are not allowed to supersede courts and laws that we place in the government. Swing low. Swing. Sweet
dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. Just help somebody. That scalpel sways the future, and behind the dim unknown stand its God within the shadow, watching over his own. How long? The only question I heard from her was, Are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down, writing, and I said, Yes. Next minute, I felt something beating in my chest. And before I knew it, I'd been stabbed by this demented woman. And I looked over her, and I'd seen. The promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. We're free at last. Georgia, a man who never finished high school. I wish y'all didn't. Oh, don't leave now. But this is what you need to hear. A man who believed in nonviolence. A man who stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, y'all don't remember, and told America and the world, Pastor, that even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, and I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream, I have a dream, that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, I have a dream. One day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, when even the state of Mississippi a state so well to ring with the heat of injustice, swell to ring with the heat of oppression, one day right there, Little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today, and y'all don't remember, that one day my four little children would one day live in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring 
ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, y'all don't hear me. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Oh, y'all don't remember. Y'all don't remember. Y'all don't remember. You don't remember when we marched. You don't remember when he said in each and every one of you, there's an instinct. It's called a drum major instinct. A desire to be great a desire to be important, a desire to lead the parade, a desire to be first. And it's a good instinct if you use it right, Mama. But I want you to be first in love. I want you to be first in moral excellence. I want you to be first in generosity. This is what I want you to do. And by giving that definition, it means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to let your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Y'all don't remember when he said, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, I want you to sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. I want you to sweep streets like Beethoven made music. I want you to sweep streets so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper, and he did his job well. Yeah. Gary, if you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, then be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub on the side of the rail. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, be a trail. If you can't be the sun, then be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Y'all don't remember. When it said, any of you are around when I have to meet my death. I don't want a long death. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too much. And every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention on that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to live his life serving others. I want somebody to mention on that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right about the war question, if y'all don't remember. I want you to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to see that day that I did try in my life to close those who were naked. I want you to be able to see that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to see that day, Bill, that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to see that I was a drum major, see that I was a drum major for justice. I was a drum major for truth. I was a drum major for righteousness, and all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. I just want to leave a committed life behind. 
And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody, and as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word of song, if I can show somebody his traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation in a world who wants a rod, if I could spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right or your left side. Not for any selfish reasons. I want to be on your right or your left side. Not in times of some political kingdom or ambition. I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. Let me close by saying we've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter what we know. Because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind like anybody I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. And I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Y'all don't hear me. I simply do this because in my lifetime, when I go downtown, and I look between the Lincoln Memorial, and the Jefferson Memorial. I see that in 2006, they dedicated a memorial to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I say, back when we were called colored, when we began to be called Negroes, using a capital N, when we became African Americans, that this country will have to stop and pause and say, here lived among our people a man who stood for something, a man who took a stand for his people. He loved us so much that he was willing to die for what he believed in. That is what I hope these young people will find out. They've killed the dreamer but they have not killed the dream. The dream is in them. They are our future. They are the best resource that we have. It is up to us to prepare our young people to be the best that they can be. You looking for a hero? You looking for a shero? Drive downtown. Go look in between the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial and see what we have something to be proud of. A man who looked like us. A man who ate collard greens and fried chicken. A man who stood for just black people to be free. In parting, I'm just asked, do you still believe in the dream? Let me try it again. Do you believe in the dream? Do you think we're going to make it? Do you think that we shall overcome? Do you really believe it? If you believe that we shall overcome, won't you stand? Won't you sing, we shall overcome? We shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Y'all can join hands if you want to.
won't you sing it one more time so they can hear you all the way downtown. Come on. Thank you, Brother Kevin. Thanks for that powerful presentation. You never fail to amaze me. Oh, by the way, some of you may know and others may not, that is my biological brother. So um, he kind of does whatever he wants to do, and um, even though he's the baby. Let's give all of our performers a round of applause. And let's give Mr. Sherman Young, the accompanist, a big round of applause, too. Is it uh, me, or has the spirit filled this place? I would say we're having a dynamic afternoon of praise and worship up in here. One thing is for certain, and two things are for sure. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. Can't you feel it? I can. I think this is a good time for us to take a short um, intermission, about five minutes, so the soloists and the accompanists and even yourselves can have time to kind of stretch and uh, regroup. After the intermission, we will bring back the featured um, soloists to do an encore performance. So before we break, why don't you just stand up? From Atlanta, Georgia. Man. that you're about to see. It's a wonderful afternoon. You're in for a great treat. So please sit back, enjoy the life, the spirit of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Just help somebody. Your scalpel sways the future, and behind the dim unknown stand his God within the shadows, watching over his own. How long? The only question I heard from her was, Are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down, writing, and I said, Yes. Next minute, I felt something beating in my chest. And before I knew it, I'd been stabbed by this demented woman. And I looked over her, and I'd seen. 
the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. We're free at last. God bless you. Thank you. May God be with you. We are pleased now to bring out this wonderful gentleman and just sit here and listen to him. You're going to learn so much and you're going to hear some great music from this wonderful choir. Please, we bring out Mr. Kevin McElvain, also known as Frederick Douglass. <laughs> To my Lord and be free. Fiendish killings, brutal beatings, shameful and shocking attacks on slave women, overworked, underfed, ill clothed. That was the slave's lot on the eastern shore of Maryland, where slavery was said to be mild. When Israel was in Egypt not a nation on earth guilty of the practices more shocking and bloody than the people of the United States at this very hour. Oh. That no man on account of his color, no man on account of his race, no man on account of his conditions is deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That mobs are not allowed to supersede courts and laws that we place in the government. Swing low. Sweet. Sweet
I could not sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. <laughs> Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the courts. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. <laughs> For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. I have looked at the South's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. Over and over I found myself asking what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched community. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr.
there's been something more than a beautiful melody tell the story of truth and reality i think that a song should be sung by a man Started to sing. We went in the jungle and you touched a lion. That's a song. And oh, that lion started to roar. Ah, you touched a bear. That's a song. That bell started to
For Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, 
though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last day, he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, then from my flesh I shall see God who I shall see on my side and my eyes shall behold. And not another, my heart faints within me. For we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out of the world. When I've come, when I've gone, the last mile of the way, amen. This is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice because even in death, God gives life. And we are glad because in that life, God produces a light. A light that continues to shine. So can you join with me on this morning and thank God for the light that is shining? Amen. The light of our beloved brother. Brother Kevin Wendell McAvane. We thank God for him. What a remarkable man of God. And we've come to celebrate. Anybody come to celebrate on this morning? Anybody come to lift up the name of Jesus? Because we were blessed to know him. And so we need to thank God because he came our way. And he left a light that will continue to shine in all of us. Come on, put your hands together once again. A loving son, a loving brother, a loving nephew, a loving uncle, a loving godfather, a loving mentor, and friend. God 
is so good. He's so good. And he's worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen. We're going to go with the program that is states in our bulletin. We will have the prayer of comfort by Minister Mark Blair. And then we'll have scripture readings by the Reverend Joy Majid. And then we'll have a musical selection. God bless you. Oh, come on. Come on. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. We come to celebrate a life well lived. Amen. I never had a chance to meet Brother Kevin, but I wish I did. I looked over his lifelong bio, and my God, what a blessing he was. And so I want to pray for this family this morning. Amen. Heavenly Father, the great I am, the maker of all things, we thank you and we come this morning giving you thanks. Because you are God. And whatever you do, God, we know that it is well with our soul. God, you are Alpha and you are Omega, God. You are the beginning and you are the finisher of our faith. And you are the author of life until you bring us home. And so we give you thanks. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for this brother... Kevin Michael Lane, Lord, we give you thanks, oh, Father God, for all that you have given him, Lord God, to share with us, oh, God. We thank you for blessing us with his gifts and his talents, God, but most importantly, oh, Father God, we thank you, Lord, Father God, that he knew you. And because he knew you, God, we know that life and his soul is well. Lord, we ask that you, Lord God, bless this family, oh God, as they, Lord Father God, go throughout this day of Lord's celebration, oh Father God, but also this emotional roller coaster, God, this thing we call life. Lord, those things that we don't understand, God, but we know that you said in your word, God, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and that in times of trouble, God, and when we are weak, oh God, and when we are sad, God, that you will send us a helpmate, the paraclete, to help us along the way, God. So when the last phone call is rung, God, and when the last card is read, oh Father God, and when it gets quiet, God, we ask that you send your comforter upon this family, God. Cover them with your Holy Spirit. Continue to encourage them along the way and let them hold on to the wonderful memories of their beloved brother, cousin, friend. We thank you this morning. We give you honor because you are God and God all your by yourself. Now have your way, God. Have your way. And it is in your son, your precious son, our Lord, in Jesus is Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Good morning, church. We come to pay tribute and to remember the life and a life well lived. For me, it was family and Kevin. I bring to you this morning the words of the Lord that they might bring understanding and comfort to your soul. The first text comes from Psalm. 27th chapter, and I'll be reading into your hearing verses 1, 4, 10, and 14. 
and the word of the Lord says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? One thing I ask of the Lord that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. O oh God of my salvation, if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. The second reading, which comes from the New Testament, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 13. And our holy book says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love, love never ends. Thank God. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, hmm, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know Fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. May you continue to carry the love for Kevin in your heart and keep his spirit alive. It is well with his soul. Amen. Some dreary days when lonely nights, but when I look around and when I think things over. They out of way my bad days, so I won't complain. Sometimes 
my clouds hang low. I could hardly see the road. I ask the question, Lord, why so much pain? But he knows what's best for me. Although my weary eyes can't see, so I just say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, I won't complain. good to me. Has he been good to you? He's been so good to me. More than this world could ever be. He's been so good. He's been so good. He's been so good. He's been so good to me. away He'll turn your darkness into day So I just say Thank you Lord Through all of my heartaches Thank you Lord I've been lied on But thank you Lord I've been criticized But thank you Lord my body's been rocked with pain, but thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, I, I won't, I won't, I won't complain. to me. I say, has he been good to you? Has he been good to you? Did he wake you up this morning? Clothed in your right mind. All the activities of your limb. God's been so good to me. More than this world could ever be. He's been so good He's been so good to me. You know what I'm talking about, Ernest? He drives all of your fears away. He'll turn your midnights into days. So I just say, thank you, Lord. He's been so good to me. Thank you, Lord. He'll open doors you cannot see. Thank you, Lord. He'll make a way out of no way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, I won't, I won't, I won't complain. Amen, amen, amen. Can somebody testify on this morning with Brother Kevin? I won't complain. My good days outweigh my bad days. I won't complain. 
Though the hill may be hard to climb sometime, I still won't complain because God is still in control and he is still blessing each and every day. So thank you, Brother Kevin, for reminding me that I won't complain. Every chance I get, I'm going to praise the Lord. Can anybody testify on this morning that every chance you get, you're going to praise the Lord? You're going to praise the Lord. And on this morning, we're praising the Lord. If you know Brother Kevin, you know that he's lived a remarkable life. A remarkable life. I was reading over his life journey, and I said, oh my God. Psalm 139 tells us, before we have lived anything in our life, God has already written the story. Before we speak a word, God already knows what we're going to say. And so God already wrote the story for Brother Kevin's life journey. And I declare, he tried to walk out everything that God wrote in his story. And so at this time, we're going to take a moment to read his life's Can we put our hands together for the life journey of Brother Kevin? Wonderful, 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 wonderful. At this time, we have some designated reflections. We will have these reflections come in this order. Joe Stringfellow, Shirley Johnson Grisby, Cynthia C.J. Maddox, Howard T. Reginald Miller II, Dr. Charlestine Fairley. And we've all been to celebrations of life, right? So I don't need to say it. If you would keep your reflections two minutes, please. God bless you. Come forth. Good morning, church. Praise it to the Lord and Savior. I have a short story that I want to tell about Kevin. I met this guy 14 years old, 15 and 16. He was in a
we met on the stage at Langley Junior High School. Talent show. Kevin McEvain showed up with a live band. <laughs> Did the James Brown. Stole the heart of the school. Year went past. I was with the Steel Tissues. We performed. Kevin was observing me the whole time. And he approached me in Mr. Tyler's pen class. Asked me, Joe, can you join my group? I'm trying to make a group. I said, sure, Kevin. I've seen you perform. You got showmanship. And I got a little bit myself. So we're going to do this. He said, okay, me, you, and Tim. He came again with two other fellas. A guy I had never met before. Wim Bubbles. Okay. First name was James. Another guy he picked from a group that was in the class of uh, his name was Ronald Barr. But I'm going to make this short story. He put me out front eighth grade. I sung Ooh Baby. Baby. The smoking. We took the show. Second time we went up, Kevin sung, I'm still here. We took the show. We rolled out. Ninth grade, we was in with talent shows all in DC, running like crazy. My parents looking at me, what you doing? Two or three o'clock in the morning, I'm coming up. Been in a talent show. Okay, all right. I said, Ma, you can come up to St. Martin's. We doing a show up there. We gets up there, we sing. My mother catch me the next morning. Mm-hmm. Looking like y'all got something. You got two years, son. You don't do nothing. You got to let it go. I said, okay, Ma. We with this band called East Side, West Side Connection. They were from Cadoza. We were from McKinley. Okay, no, but we joined together as one unit. They entered us. We was in the ninth grade. They entered us in the inner talent show, inner high talent show. There were a couple of other groups from schools around the city. We won the talent show. The contract was given to another group because we were disqualified because Kevin, Tim, Ronald, James, myself was still in junior high school. The prize was a contract with a recording studio to bring out a song. The song surfaced as a uh, Love for All Seasons by the Fuzz in the 70s. We decided then we were going to keep pushing. Kevin said, okay. Then some things came down through the group. The group disappeared. But I must say, Kevin, the whole time, was perfecting his art. I watched him perfect it. He would constantly let me know, Joe, I got this. Joe, I'm doing that. Joe, I'm here. Joe, I'm there. I'm like, Kevin, okay, keep it up. You're going to make it. He said, yeah, no, I done made it. I'm recognized, Joe. I said, yeah, you are. <laughs> Your light is shining very bright, brother. Keep it going. So he would constantly touch base with me when he came into the room. I looked at Kevin and I said, Yes, your art has perfected to the professional level. He was 
answer like yes. Then the icing on the cake was when he took on the play to do Teddy Pendergrass. Played in Chicago. I never got to see the play. But Kevin would sing to me through the phone. I'd be like, yeah, I got you. I hear you. He said, yes, but I do miss my crew, man. And I said, Kevin, I can't run the United States <laughs> running behind you. My prayers are with you. Peace be with that brother. I have many more stories to tell as we were coming up. We was actually practicing for the Inner High Talent Show. We in Langley. We confiscated a way to get into the boiler room basement of the school. We practice. Kids are coming up to us. We hear you. We hear y'all. Where y'all at? They was hearing us through the air conditioned heating unit in the vents. And we were down in the, as I said, the boiler room practicing for this talent show. Uh, the run was extremely devastating. Extreme. I must say I give all props to that guy for protecting and perfecting his talent. God be with you, Kevin. I'll see you on the other side. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shirley Johnson Grigsby, and I had the great honor to work with Cheryl Wissanat at the National Council of Negro Women. I was a program manager for Shell Oil Company, and we worked and honored outstanding teachers of African American children all across the country. And it was a large program that Cheryl put worked, and they recon they would recognize teachers through this very long and arduous process regionally and the north, south, east, and west all across the country. And once they recognized them, we would celebrate them, say, in California, Chicago, Cleveland, Dallas, Atlanta, and then we would bring all of the teachers here to Washington, D.C. for a culminating event uh, that coincided with the Black Family Reunion on the Mall. And once they were here, it was just a grand, grand affair, as it was all over the country. It wasn't anything to maybe send out 500 invitations. And Cheryl and I had to be responsible for coordinating these events across the country with um, the local chapters of the National Council of Negro Women and their executives and, and their whole network of volunteers. Well, when you brought them to D.C., of course, it was a super grand. You had to plan travel, hotels, luncheons, caterers, photographers, all of that. In addition to congressional visits, they would go and we have to arrange for them to visit with their congressmen and senators. And they would also have to have some sort of event there on, on the mall. And then there would be a grand luncheon where we would bring them all in. We would have um, Shell executives. We would have NCNW board members, executives, Dr. Dr. Hike, congressmen, senators. And we always had to have entertainment. Of course, Kevin was always available at our call. And this one particular event, he came, came to Washington, D.C., and as I'm sure you know, if Kevin's going to show up, he showed up, stepped in, and turned the place out. You know, just brought the house down. And so um, when I, uh, I have had moved to, to Houston from here, I really am a Washingtonian, but I uh, moved to Houston and I've been there ever since. But I found myself back for the past couple of weeks taking care of my elderly mother who is in an assisted living here and taking her, catching her up on her doctor's appointments and so forth and so on, and a whole list of things associated with uh, uh, settling her estate, celebrating her birthday and all of that. So um, it's just a list as long as my arm. So Cheryl calls the other day, and I'm in the parking lot getting ready to go in the store, and she gives me this devastating news about Kevin passing. We'd stayed in touch all these years, and from, I always knew he was having his health issues, but of course, 
I'm sure it hit all of you all the same way that I did. I mean, it's just this deep um, sadness and void you feel for, for losing such a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, when she, uh, she was sharing with me um, a story about how devastating it was for her and uh, reminiscing about when he first came home from the hospital. She said she was about six years old. And she said when he came home, she was so excited to have her baby brother. She just, I told, told her mother, I'm going to take care of him. I'm going to take him. And she said, well, you, you too young. You can't take care of him. She said, you just watch and see. You just watch and see. I'm going to take care of my baby brother. And as, it, as life has it, she took care of him from the beginning to the end. And she shared how blessed she felt she was to be at the end, to be able to take care of him. Uh, and he was one of the things you wouldn't believe that he was concerned about was, he said, turned to her and he said, you know what, Nisi? He says, you know, when, when I leave, he said, you know, you've got your children, you've got your grandchildren and everything. And he says, and when I leave, he says, he says, I won't have a legacy. You have a legacy. Can you believe that? The way that this man touched all of us here, all of us that, that were able to make it, and I'm sure some of the ones that may be watching on live stream can believe that one of the things he was worried about was a legacy, the least of his, his worries. And so she told me, she says, uh, well, he's going to, she gave me the you know, information about the service and everything. And uh, she didn't know that I was in town. So I said, oh yeah, well, I'm here in town, so I'll, I'll come to the service. Or she said, oh, I, I can only have 100 people, so, but the viewing is going to be from such and such. So I said, okay, I'll make sure that I come and give my respects. Of course, I expected to come in and tip out and give my respects, and that was it. Well, later that evening, I get a text from her, and she asks me to speak. I'm going, oh, my God, I hate public speaking, to tell you the truth. I hate it. I had to do it when I was working, but I hated it. I rise to the occasion. So... I laid there, you know, the next day, and I'm, you know, find, trying to find ways to get out of this. I'm going, okay. <sighs> you know, I, and I'm going, okay. Literally, I'm going, oh, God, how can I get out of this? Okay. And you, as you know, sometimes the easiest thing to do is the wrong thing. The hardest thing to do is the right thing. So I said, okay, well, I can't say no. You know, I got to, I got to get through this. I've lost about three nights of sleep, by the way, trying, worried about getting up here, <laughs> given this. And so I said, you know, I, had, you know, I didn't have time to sit down and, and write a speech or whatever, but the Spirit said, you already know what to say. It's in your heart. You just say what's in, what's in your heart. And, and I had, and to not, to tell her no would be to deny his legacy. And that was what he was worried most about. And I could not do this. So get up and speak from the heart. And now that I'm here and, and having, you know, reminiscing and getting to see his talent again and hearing him sing and it just touches your spirit. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I'm almost certain when you hear him sing, it's just, it's just almost angelic, you know, and to sing, to think about his productions and what he left and the lives uh, that he's touched and the memories that he left. That's the last thing that he has to worry about because his legacy will live on through me and all of you that are here today and he's touched along the way. So, dear Kevin, just that's the last of your words. And I know he's probably in heaven directing the choir, producing a play, talking to Martin, talking to, you know, everybody. so he's, he's there. You know, his spirit is there and he's here. But one thing I do know that, you know, you've always heard that, you know, well, I don't remember what they said, but I know how they made me feel. And so whenever I think of Kevin, my heart is, there's going to be a smile in my, on my face. And my heart is just going to be full of love. And, and Cheryl, thank you so much, because this was an honor to get here and to speak on his behalf. And Kevin, sing with the angels, sweetie. You have job, a life well lived and a job well done. He lived it with love, purpose, and commitment. And that's the least of your worries, my sweet Kevin. Sleep on. Thank you. My name is Cynthia C.J. Maddox. Kevin was my bonus brother, my friend, 
and my spiritual advisor. In 1985, my children and I was in a play called The Regal Theater in Chicago, in Chicago, Illinois. And one day before rehearsal, this man came in to audition. And baby, all he had to say was, you better stop, baby. <laughs> the 20 cast members came running in the room to see who that was. And when he finished singing, my daughter said, Ma, you think he gonna get the job? I said, baby, if he don't, we gonna buy Okoro some hearing aids. Well, he got the job. I gave him a few tips, and the rest is history. In 1990, Kevin and I both got a job at the Chicago Historical Society. And I was glad he got it because I didn't drive on the Dan Ryan or the Outer Drive. So I was more than thrilled to pick Kevin up, get in the passenger seat, and let Kevin drive my car. Well, we did that three days a week for about four years. And then Kevin got a better job doing historical characters. Well, when he was telling me the good news, I was happy. But in my head, I was thinking, oh, Lord, I'm going to be driving all day and night to get to work and then get home. But Kevin had decided that in the three weeks that he had left at the Historical Society, he was going to make sure that I could drive on the outer drive and the Dan Ryan, and I mastered that. And, I'm, and today, when I'm on the Dan Ryan and outer drive, baby, my pedal, is, my pedal is to the metal, and I shouldn't do that. Uh, then I had wrote a play called Mama Thinks We Are Slaves. And I had hired Kevin to be the father in the show because I had a, um, a nine-year-old young lady who was singing. And Kevin was going to be her father, and I gave them a song. Well, in the, she could sing. But, baby, when Kevin got finished with, with her, she was singing. And when the show was performed, they got a standing ovation, daughter and father. And in the 37 years that Kevin and I have been friends, we had one disagreement. What happened was that Kevin was uh, on the radio, WVON radio station in Chicago, Illinois, and it was Black History Month, and he was talking about all his historical characters. Well, he decided to bring up that if you're looking for a Harriet Tubman, you should hire CJ. You should hire CJ. That's my nickname. I couldn't wait for Kevin to get off the radio, finish talking to everybody and get in his car. And I called Kevin. He said, did you hear me say your name? I said, Kevin, you didn't say my name. The people that hire me and pay me and know I do Harriet Tubman, they don't know nothing about no CJ. You were supposed to say Cynthia Maddox. And he was sorry, and I knew he was sorry. And so I told him, I said, well, Kevin... You can no longer call me CJ, just in case you get on TV next time and make a mistake. I said, you have to call me Cynthia. So in the beginning, he would say, see Cynthia, and I smiled because I knew he was trying. He'd been calling me CJ for a long time. But then in the end, he started calling me my Cynthia. He said, I was his Cynthia, and you were my Kevin. And you know what? What makes all this easier for me is the great memories. So people, get great memories with the people you love. Because I believe, I, oh, Jesus, it helps. It helps so much. Thank you. Good morning, church. 
My name is Howard Miller. I am Cheryl Nisi's son, and Kevin, of course, is my uncle. And I was born during the riots after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And one of the earliest images I have is an image that my uncle took of me on the corner on Franklin Street in the little green and white swinging fence. Kevin has always been a part of my life and I'm trying to reform my mind to this new reality where he's not immediately accessible. And so I was thinking about that this morning and I was thinking about how when an elder dies, a library burns to the ground. <laughs> but as I was thinking, the library could burn to the ground, but the words and the songs and the memories that those books and that those elders have created, those are the things that remain with you. Those are the things that are your living cultural black memory that gets transmitted from me to you to the next person and to the next person. And as you look around today, just take a minute, look around. I want you all to remember that every single African-American black person you see up here and around you is a miracle, is a miracle. And uh, many would want me to share one story with you. In 2011, her husband, Calvin Lockridge, became sick. He had gone into the hospital for what we thought was gonna be a very routine procedure and he was just gonna get stabilized and then home. A few days later, we got a call saying we needed to come to the Veterans Administration Hospital right away because he was non-responsive. We were like, huh? He was fine literally yesterday and he was non-responsive. Things happen very, very quickly. And as we all know, in the age of COVID, things can happen very, very quickly. He ended up being in the hospital for four months in a near comatose state. We were there every day because that was one of the things that Kevin and others showed me and my family. You show up for family and you let people know that you belong to somebody and that somebody is watching out for you. And so we showed up and we were there every single day. But even doctors with all their knowledge, they're not the ones up above and they have their limitations. And the doctors didn't know what to do. Aunt Minnie said, call Kevin. We called Kevin. Kevin sang through the phone to my uncle, Calvin. He didn't respond to the white doctors. And that's understandable for me, not to them, but for me, because he was a Southern boy from Tennessee. He wasn't going to respond to you. He responded to me. He responded to Aunt Minnie. But I want you to know this man, near comatose, not responding to outside stimulation, Kevin began to sing over the phone. Calvin listened. We saw recognition in his eyes. Kevin continued to sing. Calvin reared up in the hospital bed. And that was nothing short of a miracle. Kevin had a God-given gift that allowed him to see and communicate the divine. And that divine said to Calvin at that time, it's not your time, you still have work to do. Get up and do the work you were called to do. And from that moment on, Calvin made his recovery. And so he was with us five years when he shouldn't have been because of Kevin. And so I will always take with me all the memories 
of my uncle Mac, uh, all the all the memories, and those are the things that I will carry with me. And even though I am sad, I know that to be absent in the body is to be in the presence of God. And I know He's with Aunt Georgiana, eating her wonderful cornbread, Shirley sweet potato pies, Granny's greens. He's hanging out with Uncle Shorty and his brothers and all of his family members. And I'm just waiting to see him sing me in when it's my turn to come. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Charlestine Fairley, former dean of the Annapolis campus of Sojourner Douglas College. I knew there would be a number of stories about Kevin, especially since Cheryl asked me to speak last. It took me a long time to determine what I would say because I have many, many memories of Kevin and I knew I had a short time to talk. Kevin became my son because Cheryl chose me as her surrogate mother when we were on a trip to South Africa. So it would only be natural when I met Kevin for the first time in Atlanta, Georgia, when he was starring, starring in a play, I believe it was Keep the Faith. He was Adam Clayton Powell when I first met him in Atlanta. And at the moment of our meeting, I immediately had an impression about him even before I knew him. Kevin was blessed with musical and dramatic talent. I saw him at our meeting as being young, gifted, and black. And ever since I learned of Kevin's sunset, that song has been in my ear. Kevin was truly a gift from God to us. And Kevin was generous with that gift gift that he was given. Without hesitation, he generously gave his gift to his alma mater, Sojourner Douglas College, the Annapolis chapter, and to me as the dean of that campus. He performed a one-man show, an evening with Frederick Douglass, which was our first successful fundraiser to support the campus. His generosity to me was memorable and deeply appreciated. No matter where Kevin was located at the time, when I called, he answered. He performed at my 70th birthday in Biloxi, Mississippi, my hometown. He sang at my mother's 
homegoing celebration in Chicago, Illinois. And he sang at, the, at my husband's service in Washington, D.C. No matter when I called, he was there for me. And I could hardly hold myself together when I heard Kevin sing, I Won't Complain. Because this was a song that he sang to me frequently when I called and I was facing a challenge or having a difficult time. All I had to do was to call his number and he sang that song to me. I remember Kevin as a scholar son of Sojourner Douglas College, young, gifted, and black, with tremendous generosity. I had expected Kevin to feel, fulfill my final request to sing at my home going, but God does not make mistakes. He knows what's best. Kevin, Kevin, my son, my friend, I loved him and I will miss him. Amen. It was so great to hear all the wonderful reflections about Brother Kevin and the relationships that he formed. And now we'll hear from his family. A message to my brother from Stacy McElvain Sr. and Cheryl McElvain Wissanot. My name is Stacy McElvain. I'm Stacy. <laughs> Kevin's younger brother. Um, I wasn't really prepared to speak because I don't usually do this. Um, as a kid, what I remember of Kevin was I was scared of Kevin. I was always scared of Kevin. Um, my first memories of Kevin was always that dude is me. Um, it wasn't until I got older and once I was grown that I, uh, I established a little bit more of a relationship with Kevin. And, uh, <clears throat> that's when I started to realize, you know, who Kevin really was. The one thing that I remember about Kevin most and the one thing that I'll always remember is Kevin's voice. The way he was able to project his voice and how strong his voice was always gave me goosebumps. Um, when he would speak, and especially when he would do his acting thing, when I saw him do the Teddy Pendergrass, I was, I was shocked. I was like, man, that's my brother. <laughs> I didn't even know he had it in him. But uh, his voice was always something that made me feel like Kevin's voice is stronger than any voice I've ever heard. Um, and him, the way he projected it and the way it carried through the room was something that was always great to me. Um, I'm going to miss him. message that I was going to say about my brother, but um, I'm just going to 
talk to you. Surely he told you that from the day my mother brought him home. I told um, mommy, you don't have to worry about him. He's mine. I will take care of him. As I was sharing this story with Shirley, my mother said to me, nieces, you are too young. You are only six and a half years old. How can you take care of a newborn? And I said, watch me. The, I have always been Kevin's advocate, friend, inspirer, and a number of other things. But what I do what I'm happy for is that in the four last months of my brother's life that we sat down and we talked about everything. Kevin shared with me why he wanted to sing. And I said, well, why did you want to sing? He said, because I was sitting on the basement step when you were singing with your group practicing. And when I heard y'all, I said, I can do that and better. <laughs> so I said to him, is that the reason why he said, because you inspired me. And I said, well, I didn't know that. I said, I remember the Taller show, the show at St. Martin's Catholic Church. Me being older, Kevin was a teenager. I and my best friend, Sheila, decided from work that we would go check Kevin out. We went to the Taller show. And I was standing like, <coughs> I said to Sheila, my brother can sing. <laughs> He's been telling me that. But I didn't know it until I saw it. The other time that we talked, and I said that we talked, we talked about everything. I shared with him how I was amazed that from October to the beginning of April, Kevin never went outside except to go to school. And his reasons that he didn't go outside was it was too cold. Then as his, he matured and went to college and all of that, I said, why would you go to a place that you would have to walk underground because it was too cold? Why? He said, I got a football scholarship. I said, but you don't like the cold. He said, but I got used to it. I'm not going to talk about everything, but one of the things that I told him is that, like I said, um, he wouldn't go outside. I said, but when you were in the house, you watched every sports event, football, basketball, golf, tennis, hockey, soccer, and, you know, then they had those little baseball cards. Kevin memorized every card that he had with the statistics of the team. And you could not be wrong and mention that this was so-and-so. Kevin would say, oh, you're wrong. And he could rack off at a drop of a hat anything that you wanted to know about any player, 
or any team. I told him that I was, I was amazed that he could do that at such an early age. And he shared with me, he said, but Nisi, it's because of my ability to remember that I'm able to act in the theater. I remember my line. So in closing, I want to say Kevin and I had a nickname for each other. I was Medea, and he was Joe. And we acted like Medea and Joe. I remember one day, you know, Kevin lost sight in one of his eyes. I'm claustrophobic. I don't like a lot of stuff around me. Anybody who knows my brother, he might have stuff everywhere, but his music, his VCRs, v v uh, video stuff, you could not. He could be in the back of the church, and you took something out of his, his music. He could tell you, you have so-and-so. And so, the last thing, the last thing, the last thing I said, Kevin, he said, Nisi, you took care of me as a baby, and you're taking care of me now. I said, but in, if you understand life, I said, one thing that I realized and one thing that told me, I'm a major stroke victim survivor, is that we come in as children and we go out as children. And we had complete circle. When he came to back here, he drove a U-Haul truck with all of his things with one bad eye from Chicago to D.C. and to Maryland. And I asked him, I said, Kevin, you know I couldn't sleep. I would call him periodically, where are you? Have you taken your insulin? Have you eaten? Have you pulled over to the side to take a rest? He said, Nisi, you have to know God. He said, I know God for myself. He said, that was God. He said, I prayed and asked God to take the will. And he got me here. He said, it took me 14 hours, but I got here. And so I'm going to miss my baby brother. I have other brothers too. But Kevin was my sibling, but I looked at him from the time that he was, I was six and a half years old. He was mine. He was my baby. And anybody who knows him, he would always say, I tell everybody about you, Nisi. And I said, well, you, I hope you tell them that my real name is Cheryl. Denise is my middle name, and nobody but the family calls me Nisi and people who have known me from a child. I love you, Kevin. And I'm going to miss just talking to you. I'm going to miss when you say, look at you. You're all broke down. And I said, Joe, if you don't get in that back room and leave me alone, I'm going to put you out. Thank you. Amen. Medea and Joe. <laughs> okay, God bless you. At this time, we're going to have uh, Minister Mark Blair will read the church paper. After that, we will have cards and acknowledgments by Lawana. Patterson Griffin, a proclamation from the William McKinley Technical High School, class of 1974, by Judy Bowie 
Robinson, then a musical selection, and then we'll come back with the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. If there is any uh, Allen Knights here today, would you please stand? Yes, ma'am. But you don't have to stand. You're the family. We here for you. Amen. We thank God for Brother Kevin and his family. Amen. To the family of Brother Kevin McElvain, Wayne, we, the members of Allen Chapel AME Church family, are saddened and deeply grieved at the passing of Brother Kevin McElwain. The brother of our sister Cheryl was an act. We offer to you our sincere condolences. In his divine providence, God has chosen to call Brother McElwain home from the church militant to the church triumphant. We believe that he is at peace with God and that all is well with his soul. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. We pray that the many pleasant memories that you shared with your brother, McElwain, during his life will sustain you during the coming days. Know that the entire Allen Chapel fan church family stands by you during these difficult days. Sincerely yours, Reverend Dr. Michael E. Bell, Sr., Senior Pastor, and our First Lady, Lena Michelle Bell. Cards received and family would like to have acknowledged. In times of sorrow, when words of comfort we needed most, it seems they are often most difficult to say. But many, but may you find comfort in knowing that warm thoughts and sympathy are with you. Peace and blessings always, Terry. Time is God's gift. We all need a time to grieve quiet time for reflections to shift these through memories and come to grips with what has happened. We all need a time for tears, not for the one that is not with us now, at pe that is now at peace with God in heaven, but for ourselves as we realize that things will never be the same. We all need a time to just be, a time when we can feel the comfort and reassurance that God's everlasting love brings to heal our hearts. They're praying God's peace and comfort for our loss for our loved one, and may the condolences of the loss of your brother Kevin, we are with you. Love always, the Curtis, Thomas, and Allen Chapel family. Wishing you peace. Tenderly may time heal your sorrow. Gently may friends ease your pain. Softly may peace replace heartache, and may warmest memories remain with sympathy from your sorrows Felton and Therese Burst. Thank you, sir. And we have resolutions that what they would like read. The Spirit Redeemed Missionary Baptist Church, Reverend Daniel J. Garrett, pastor teacher. Condolences. The future is not ours to know, and it may never be. So let us live and give our best 
not anticipating or doubting the power of our Savior, asking nothing of tomorrow except thy will be done. On behalf of the official board and the congregation of the Spirit Redeemed Missionary Baptist Church of Chicago, Illinois, we would like to express our most sincere sadness at the passing of Brother Kevin W. McIlvain. In a time of great sorrow, please know that you are in our thoughts and our prayers. We realize that times like this, word seems inadequate. Please know that we are praying for Sister Luana F. Griffin and the entire family. May your brother rest in peace and God bless. Revelations 21 and 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from your eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Behold, all things are done new, made new. Done by your other, the Spirit Redeemed Baptist Church, Reverend Daniel J. Garrett, Pastor Teacher, Sister Edwina McLaurin, Church Clerk. Resolution from the John M. Marshall Harlan High School Alumni Association of Chicago, Illinois. And we do have some Harlan Knights in the building, so I'm going to ask Harlan High School classmates to please stand. From Chicago, Illinois, if you went to Harlan, we ask that you stand. Resolutions. For I am now ready to be offered up, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith, and I have finished my course. I Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them that have lived according and love his approaching. Timothy 2, 4, 6 through 8. To the family, the loved ones, church family, and friends, it's our joy... No, in our joy and our sorrow, thou hast taught us to pray in the heartbreaking loss of a dear brother, a friend, a fellow classmate, a Harlan Hall of Famer, a Harlan Rising Mentor, and alumni, Brother Kevin McIlvain. We know you feel a great void that only God's grace, love, and mercy can fill. With hearts aching in sorrow, we, the John Marshall Harlan School Alumni Association of Chicago, Illinois, in humble submission to our Heavenly Father, extend our sincere condolences and sympathy to the family in the calling home of Kevin McIlvain. We extend our heartfelt sympathy to the family and friends, knowing that he will be greatly missed. We can take comfort in knowing that he is resting in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, relaxing his light and warmth of his love, where he has found peace and perfect joy. We thank our God for his life and memory and pray for those nearest to him who feel the loss the greatest. Therefore, be it resolved that a copy of this resolution be placed in the records of uh, the Alumni Association and a copy be sent to the family. Given under the hands and the seal of the John Marshall Harlan High School Alumni Association this third day of April 2022. Respectively submitted, Jamal Randy Allen Rashad, President. Resolution of the News, thank you. Resolution of the New Samaritan church to the family of brother kevin McIlvain, the new samaritan baptist church family wishes to express our deepest sympathy at the passing of your loved one be assured that we are lifting you up in the lord and prayers and in prayer during this time of your bereavement we are thankful that the spirit of the living god through his holy word provides eternal hope and strength even in a time of sorrow may you find comfort in the promise that second corinthians 5 and 17 5 and 1 provides for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal into heavens. We offer you now and always our support and love. Moreover, we pray for God's abundant love to surround you in the days to come and give you peace that surpasses all understanding. May you forever be in his presence. Yours in Christ, Bishop Michael and Elder Sheila Kelsel, Associate Minister's Office and the New Samaritan Baptist Church family. Resolution, church resolution to our, the family of Brother Kevin W. McIlvain. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work to the close of the day, I shall see the great king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile of the way. Whereas we, the entire membership of the Divine Providence Baptist Church, along with our pastor, feel that it is befitting to express our sympathy to the family during the passing of Brother Kevin McIlvain, we commend you to him who knoweth best and will always do right. You have our sincere prayers. Whereas in the providence of God, he has brought to a close this life of your loved one, according to his tender mercy. God, who is infinite in his wisdom, makes no mistakes. We are encouraged and consoled in the words of Jesus, who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
Therefore, be it resolved that through his presence with the great, though his presence will be greatly missed by his loved ones, to, and to our first lady, the sister of Brother McAvain, and the entire family, you can be assured that Divine Providence Baptist Church family is here to support and pray for you. Psalms 30 and 5 says, For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution will be given to the family of Brother McAvain and a copy placed in the archives of the church. To the family of Brother McAvain, we know your loss is deep and your sorrow is great, but we want you to know that we share in your sorrow, but more importantly, we recognize that our loss is heaven's gain. Humbly submitted on the 28th day of March, 2022, the pastors and members of Divine Providence Baptist Church, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Dr. Michael Aaron Griffin, pastor, Sister Betty J. Barnesfield, church and announcement clerk. We, the family of Kevin McElvain, find it time to acknowledge, say our acknowledgement that we are profoundly grateful to God for the gifts of family and loved ones who have been so kind and supportive during the illness and trans transition of our beloved Kevin. Your prayers, your calls, your emails, your texts, and the fellowship and visits are sincerely appreciated and we move more formally acknowledged at a later date. Thank you. Kevin, my brother, it's time for you to meet the test. Giving all honor and praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, I count it an honor and a joy to be able to be here on behalf of my fellow Techites. Will all the class numbers of McKinley class of 1974 please stand? Resolution of Sorrow was adopted by McKinley Tech High School class of 1974 on Saturday, February the 26th, 2022, expressing our heartfelt support for our fellow classmates. We first departed on graduation day, Thursday, June 13th, 1974, and now our final departure. Whereas McKinley Tech High School class of 1974 are in mourning for the transformation of one of our family members as he joins the Supreme Educator. Whereas on Saturday, June 23rd, 1956, on that beautiful day over 60 years ago, Kevin W. McElvain was born. With his ever supportive spirit, Kevin I'm sorry, with his ever supportive spirit, McKinley Tech High School, class of 1974, has long benefited from his selfless dedication. He was a faithful servant, exemplifying God's characteristics. His presence will truly be missed as his spirit lives on in the many lives he touched throughout his lifetime. Whereas Kevin had a well of, char of charitableness making sacrifices, giving, and assisting others whenever possible. As he was taught the tech way, he continued being a winner, leading the cause. Being from the old school, he wore life's attributes proudly, kindness, mannerism, and respect, just to name a few. Whereas Kevin W. McEvain has given so much of himself to his family, friends, and loved ones. He deserves this honorable recognition and appreciation. And whereas on Monday, March 28, 2022, Kevin W. McEvain 
has earned his final grade. His presence will truly be missed here, but now he's made that crossover to heaven's graduation and will share with the father's class as he continues to keep his head to the sky. Now, therefore, be it resolved that McKinley Tech High School class of 1974 hereby extend our heartfelt sympathy to the McEvain family. And we are directed to transmit a copy of this resolution to the McEvain family and place a copy in our archives. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now will all McKinley Techites please stand, regardless of the year. This is the Tech way. The final bell has now rung for Kevin W. McEvan. Take your, take your rest, my brother. God's peace be with you. The storms don't cease, and if the wind keeps on blowing in my life, my Sometimes in this life We're gonna be tossed By the waves and the currents That seem so fierce But here's the best part But in the word of God I've got an anchor And it keeps me steadfast and unmovable despite the tide. But if, if the storms don't cease, and just in case the wind it keeps on blowing in my life. My, my soul has been anchored in, in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. The billows may roll, the breakers may dash. I shall not sway because he holds me fast. So dark the day, clouds in the sky. I know it's all right, because Jesus and I, you put me down. But Jesus picks me up, he's always there. When the going gets tough, in sunshine and rain, sickness and pain, he's always there, so I won't complain. My soul has been
to God be the glory for the thing he is doing right now. One more time, show your love for Kevin Window Michael Bell. Let me also honor and recognize Pastor Bell, who is not here today. Thank you for allowing me to share this space. I want to say thank you. And you all make sure you tell them I said thank you. Reverend Walls did a wonderful job, ain't she? Show your love. And to the ministerial staff here, and to you, you, and all of you, to the established protocol, those that want to be called, who haven't been called, we honor you also, to Lottie, Dottie, and everybody. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. I have been um, preaching now some, wow, 39 years. No, about 34, 35 years. Pastoring now, 31 years. And this is the first time that I witnessed the deceased singing at their own funeral. What a unique thing. Put something on my mind. Maybe I do my own eulogy when it's my time. <laughs> Wonderful job. Sure, wonderful job. I shall not um, hold you long. Uh, today is Monday. Somebody said that Kevin was stubborn, which is right. I had to look at the time because I want to make sure that I'm out of here in time enough to watch General Hospital. I got to see what happened from Friday cliffhanger to today. And I don't need Kevin to mess it up. I'm going to go and do what we need to do and get on out of here. Met Kevin um, some almost 40 years ago. Met him when he and when Luana and I was getting together. I think it was called Coton, Corton back in those days. I don't know what they call it now. And um, Kevin and I developed a great friendship, a great bond, a great relationship. And of course, he was in our wedding some 37 years ago. And you're right, stubborn, 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 stubborn. Anytime Kevin was down the same, he just couldn't come up and sing. Wherever Kevin is sitting at, he got the star singing from way in the back. Never starts at the beginning of a song. Come on down, say a few words, and then sing what he going to sing. And then sang on his way back to his seat. I said, Kevin, you ain't got to do all that now. Just come on and just sing. I, I got you, brother law. I got you. Sure enough, call him up. Start back. You know you're on program, Kevin. Why you not down in the front already? This, this ain't the theater today. 
but to God be the glory. To love him, to know him is to love him, to love him is to know him. And all of you all have shared that by being with you, being here on today um, with this family. There is a word from the Lord in Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And I'm reading from the Voice Bible. And the word says, I have fought the good fight. I have stayed on course and finished the race. And through it all, I have kept believing. The next verse says in the Voice Bible, I look forward to what's in store for me, a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the always right and just judge, will give me that day. But it is not only for me, Paul said, but for all those, us, who love and long for his appearance. I thought today, because of Kevin and who he is, who he was, that we would talk about for a few minutes the final curtain call. The final curtain call. Wester defines a curtain call as an appearance by a performer after the final curtain of a play in response to the applause of the audience. They will come back on stage, take another bow, throw a kiss, wave a hand. And when I think about Kevin and his days of performing, his days of acting, singing, and dancing, this, dearly beloved, is his last and final curtain call. Yes, Kevin was indeed a great performer, had a chance to see him perform many occasions. And, and one of his performances, I shall never forget, when he was playing Jackie Wilson. And, and, and if, you, if you didn't know who it was, you really thought it was Jackie himself. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting because Jackie going to split. He going to spin. And lo and behold, Kevin did it. <laughs> Had him down to a T. Teddy, you name it. He was able, he was gifted to perform and portray many characters. I'm gonna miss that. I'm gonna miss that. I'm gonna miss that 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 um voicemail when you call this phone. You have reach. <laughs> I want to speak to Kevin. I want to speak to Martin. <laughs> he always had a way of keeping you laughing. He, he, he knew when to be serious. He knew when to be funny. He, he just had that about him. And as I look at Paul and I thought about Paul and his life, and he had a feeling of accomplishment. Paul could feel proud of the way he had lived. He had honored the Lord until the very end. But in this text, Paul uses what I call three images to describe how he viewed his life. When I think about Kevin, I see a parallel between Paul and Kevin in this particular text. Notice, first of all, if you will, he said, I have fought the good fight. Paul, yes, has endured a lot of battles through the years. You, you do remember Paul, don't you? When he was Saul, he, he, he was a bad, you know what, you, you know. That's what he was. Killing everybody, doing this here, but when he had that encounter with the Lord and how the Lord changed his life, 
Paul had endured many battles, shipwrecked, imprisoned, bitten by a snake, you name it, he has endured many battles. He had battles with government officials. He had battles with the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. He even endured battles with his own people, the Jewish people, who tried to lead Christians astray. He had endured battles with people who twisted and exhorted the message of the gospel in order to, in order to lead people to live the lives of immorality. He he even battled, dearly beloved, against his own sinful tendencies. And through all of this, Paul reached the point of his life and said, I have fought a good fight. What does that mean? What does that entail? Paul was proud that he had fought for what he knew was right, not for his own sake, but for the sake of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He fought when people challenged the gospel message. He fought when people tried to, to twist the scriptures. He fought when people twisted the truth. He Listen, Paul didn't fight over petty stuff like many of us do now. He fought over things that was worth fighting over. One of the problems that we have is many of us, we are major in the minors instead of and minor in the major. We got this thing all twisted up. But if we want to fight the good fight, we need to choose the fight for the things that are good. Kevin fought the good fight. He had health challenges. Some Kevin was also a person that kind of kept to himself. You he really didn't broadcast what was really wrong with him. But he had health challenges. When that song said, I won't complain, Kevin didn't complain. He fought a good fight. Diabetes, you name it, heart problems. and health. He fought it. He kept going. He kept singing. He kept on doing the things that he was doing. Kevin fought the good fight. He pursued it. He kept on. He wasn't going to let those things challenge him. And I agree. I agree, sure. Back here in October, we on vacation. We in Arizona, Arizona. Scottsdale, Arizona. And I believe that we was on our way. I don't know if we were on our way to Tombstone or something. Luana gets a call. Our best friends, we're in the car, and Luana starts crying. And we won't know what's going on. And she's talking to Kevin. And Kevin is on the highway, on his way to Washington, D.C. She said, Kevin, you can't see. And he talked about our cousin Milton, who tragically lost one eye many, 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 many years ago. And he said he was my greatest inspiration. Luan said, but he been he had one eye for years. You just got your, but I can make it. And he was already in South Bend, Indiana. So he was too far to turn around and go back home. He's driving by himself in the rain. She said, Kevin, be careful. Make sure you let me know that you made it, which he didn't do. Now, Luana calling Cheryl's phone, bringing, bringing up her phone. Has Kevin made it? Because Kevin didn't do, almost ran out of gas, but he kept on going. He fought the good fight. Secondly, Paul said, I have finished the race. This is another image that is rich and one that many of you can actually relate and here's what's interesting here. Paul never said, I run, I, I, I won the race. He said, I finished the race. He didn't say, I won the race. He said, I finished the race. There was a, it, it was, it's a true story that's told a few years ago as a runner. I, I, I can't remember exactly where it was from. I want to say, I want to say Africa. 
but they, they had sent him to New York to run this race. And, and he got hurt along the way. He got hurt along the way. And the interesting part is many people tried to get him to quit the race, drop off the race, and he wouldn't do it. Everybody else done crossed the finishing line. And they waiting on this last runner to finally come in. And when he came in, the reporters and everything went to him. Why you didn't quit? Why you didn't stop? You're hurting. You're in pain. How come you didn't stop? And he said, my country didn't send me to quit the race. They sent me to finish the race. I might have came in last place, but I finished the race. Paul realized the fact that he wasn't trying to win no prize down here. But Paul said, I finished the race. See, most people are proud simply to have completed a marathon. And they are not consumed with how they finish compared to other runners. Victory for most marathoners is in the finishing of the race. And their mind is, you're not going to make me stop until I cross over the finishing line. A marathon runner is proud because they didn't quit running when things got hard. That is why that is why you see people with the stickers that say 26.2 or 13.1 on their cars. Because I asked somebody in the gas station one day, and they said they may not have won, but and they may not have placed in their age group, but they finished the race. And they are proud of what they done. Dearly beloved, what a great picture of the Christian life. The Christian life is not a sprint. The Christian life is a marathon. It's a mar It requires us to keep running until, keep running toward the Lord until the race is won, until we cross the finishing line. You know, one of the problems I have with uh, church folk, that we start this race in the church and we quit along the way. We quit when our feelings get hurt. Can I just throw this in right quick? Let me just pause for station identification. And let me just throw this out. Dearly beloved, church hurt is the worst pain, worst hurt you can ever endure. Don't. Don't get mad if they tell you you can't sing. Just get on the usher board. Get on the greeters committee. Don't, don't get mad because they tell me all the time that I can't sing. They say you shouldn't try to sing. You know? Pastor, don't, don't try to sing. Don't, don't, don't try to sing. Couple things though, I tell them I sang number one because I got the mic. I sang number two because I got a musician that you want to get paid, you better find my key <laughs> on that organ. But the main reason I sang is because I'm happy, and it's because I'm free. And God's eyes is on the sparrow. I know some folks that can sing, but they got dirty, even, rotten, stinking heart. But don't, don't quit. Don't, 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 don't quit uh, because folks don't like your macaroni and cheese. Don't get upset because you can't cook. Don't get, join the choir or something. Do something that you can. Don't quit the church. Church hurt is the worst hurt that you can endure. I told somebody the other day that the church is the only army that kills its wounded. If you ever watch War Story, anytime somebody get hurt on the battlefield, the federal soldier try to bring them to safety. But there ain't ideas in the church. Somebody fall in the church, we help crucify. I told y'all he wasn't no good. Don't get quiet on me. Y'all make me think you're guilty. Don't get quiet on me. 
Paul said, I've been hurt, I've been talked about, I've been lied on, but I finished the race. When they tried, they were go, they put me in jail because I wouldn't quit preaching. I, when I got in jail, I didn't stop preaching. I may not have been able to stand there physically and preach. Paul said, I wrote my sermons in a letter and sent it to every church. I finished the race. And when I look at Kevin's life, that's what Kevin did. He kept going even when he wasn't feeling well. Kevin finished his race. He kept on, he kept on, he kept on dancing, he kept on singing. Kevin, uh, I think Luana showed me something. I forget uh, who it was. Was it Patty LaBelle? It was Patty LaBelle. It was it Patty LaBelle? It was Patty LaBelle. Kevin with a cane. Singing up there with Patty. He wouldn't quit. He going on up there all the way. He would not stop. He finished the race. Kevin finished. He, he wasn't going to stop. Wasn't nothing going to hinder him from doing whatever it is that he set his mind to do. When Kevin set his mind to do something, you can rest assured. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. He kept on. And then this thing, lastly, I'm almost through. Paul said, I have kept the faith. In other words, I have remained it faithful. Now, there are two ways we can understand what Paul meant by this image. First, he was saying that he kept his promise to the Lord in running the race that he had given him. Paul said, I'm not going to disappoint you, God. You gave me this assignment, and I'm going to do it. Dearly beloved, let me just throw this out at you right quick. Don't get mad or quit doing things if people don't appreciate what it is that you're doing. You have to understand. Can I say it this way? Don't let other folks' ignorance hinder you. Don't let other folks' ignorance hinder your blessing. Some folks do Trust me, there are some people that wants to be who you are, and they can't. There are some people that wants to do what you can do, and they can't. So they'll find some kind of way to try to block you and stop you. But whatever you do, be faithful. You might have to detour, but be faithful. We started out this morning making our way here. Started out. Left in good time, start out taking my time, put it in the GPS system. It sent me every which way. Because GPS in the car didn't know about all this construction that was going on. And every place they told me to turn, I couldn't turn. So by that time, Sister Griffin, my wife had it on a Google or whatever it is, map, whatever she had. I said, I'm going I'm to listen to that one. I ain't going to listen to this one. Let, let whatever you say put. Because I said, we back to the point of no return. I said, but I ain't going to quit. We're going to get there. we going to get there. And we made it. I wish I had some help up in here. It took us a roundabout way, but we made it. Wasn't going to quit. Wasn't going to get mad. And they kept on going back this way. Turn right. And every time. Now, listen. Now, 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 now. Check this out. It said merge left when it should have said turn. So when you say merge to me, that just keep on finding the arrow. Then it's talking about recalculate. But we made it. Remain faithful. He said, Lord, I'm not going to quit doing what you assigned me to do. He said, I got to keep on doing what you have told me to do. And then second way of understanding what Paul is saying is, Paul said, I held fame firmly to the truth of the Christian faith. Now again, dearly beloved, this would certainly apply to Paul. 
much of 2 Timothy is focuses on telling Timothy to hold fast to the truth no matter what, just as he had. Now, Paul was a mentor to young Timothy, and he was trying to give this young man some instruction that would help him along the way. How many of you all can agree with me that our world right now, the generations that's coming behind us would be better off if they would listen to the folks who have already gone through what you're trying to go through. I, 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 I remember those days, I remember those days when, when I used to tell my grandmama that she didn't know what she was talking about. And it took me a minute to understand what grandma meant when she said, you can't out-slick a can of oil. I said, okay. Took me a little while to learn that. But Timothy, you coming up in this ministry, let me share with you some pit stops that you're going to endure along the way. Let me help you so you don't have to go through some of these things. And our young people that's coming up behind us today, you can't tell them nothing. They know everything. But then when all hell break loose, now they want to know what you can do. And I, you know, me, myself, I just said, we're going to figure it out. I couldn't tell you before. So go on and figure it out right now. Oh, man, come on, man. Tell me what need do. I can't tell you. But it's hard for me to tell you what to do after you to mess up. I can tell you before you mess up. <laughs> but Paul said, Timothy, let me help you. Let me help you. One thing about Brother Kevin is, Brother Kevin always tried to instill wisdom. I'll be listening to him when he be talking to the little younger children and the young people and everything. And I said, okay, yeah. He, he tried to encourage them. He want them to know you can make it. He want them to know, don't let nobody stop you, nobody hindering you, nobody tell and, and And I, I think, Sheila, somebody said that Kevin said, I can do this here and do it better. You know, you're a bad fella when you can, uh, I said, Boy, this boy think he Muhammad Ali. But he was determined to be faithful, committing all of that stuff to memory, to learning all of them lines and learning all of them songs and not, not, not getting Frederick Douglass mixed up with Martin Luther. He, he was able to stay on course. He was able to do what he had to do. He remained faithful. Dearly beloved, although Kevin was an actor, he was a performer, he was singing, he kept the faith. He did not lose hold to his Christian and spiritual belief in the Lord Jesus the Christ. He did not let all of that stuff go to his head where he forgot who God is in his life. He remained faithful. Yeah. When he got through singing Teddy's song, Turn Off the Light. Sunday morning, he was saying, This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. When Kevin got through performing, he knew how to come back to where it all started at. He did not allow all of this fame and fortune go to his head that he forgot who God is in his life. He remained faithfully. And finally, as I get ready to close, and we get ready to leave this place, Paul said after all of this, he talks about his prize. Right there in verse 8. And now a prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. Paul said, and the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearance. 
He said that the waiting for him in heaven is a prize. Namely, he said, the crown of righteousness. Listen, in ancient Olympic games, the victor was given a laurel wreath, which he wore on his head like a crown. It was declaring that he was the victor, that he was the victor. Everybody that saw someone wearing a laurel wreath on their head meant that they were the winner of a particular fight or race. This wreath being made of leaves would soon wither and disappear. But the prize that would be given by the Lord on that day would never fade away. What is this crown of righteousness? I'm glad you asked. I don't know exactly what it is. But one thing I do know, that it is a blessing from God. Oh, dearly beloved, as I get ready to leave you, think about it. Paul in prison. He's in prison. He's having been declared guilty by an evil judge by the name of Nero. He was awaiting his execution at the command of the emperor at any time. And what was a comfort to Paul was that at the same moment that Nero declared him guilty and carried out his death sentence, the Lord, the righteous judge, would declare a different verdict. While Nero condemned God, condemned Paul rather, God will commend Paul. Paul knew that one day, soon and very soon, and that the Lord would declare him vindicated from all sin, deeds, and action. And he knew that the Lord's opinion was far more important than Nero's opinion or anyone else. Dearly beloved, can I tell you this here? It doesn't matter what other people think about you. You just better make sure that your record is clear with God because that's the one that will make the, the difference in our lives. Oh, all true believers will one day say, I fought a good fight, I kept the faith, I finished my course, and now laid up for me is the crown of righteousness. But dearly beloved, before I leave you, I just want to share this with you. I know this in Hollywood they got about, I, I, I know it's 10 tops award in Hollywood. You got the Oscars that we saw on last night. Yeah, I know everybody saw the punch and all that stuff. I know. I know. You got the Oscars. You got the Primetime Emmy Awards. You got the annual Golden Glove Award. You got the annual Grammys Award. You got the British Academy Television Award. You got the annual Screen Actors Guild Award. You got the ESPY Award. Even you got Spike TV VGA Video Game Award. You got the annual Daytime Emmy Awards. Then you got the MTV Movie Award. Although Kevin was never nominated for any of these awards. And although Kevin never won any of these awards, and although Kevin doesn't have a star on Hollywood Walk of Fame, he's gaining something that's far much better. Even though he does not have a star on the Walk of Fame, but one of these old days, he gonna walk the road to glory to receive not an award, but he's going to receive a reward. Can I get a witness here? Oh, dearly beloved, I'm done now. I'm done, dearly beloved. People don't like to think about death. They don't like to make will. They don't like to buy life insurance or put together a vast directive. And the reason is very simple. Because if we do those things, we are admitting to ourselves that we too one day will die. Death is something that every person will face. 
the mystery of death feels that we do not know who is next. Every one of us in this room will die if the Lord doesn't return first. And while you may think it's morbid to think about death, I think that it is wise to think about your reward in glory. People at the end of their lives often have a clarity that is absent in other phases of life. They are able to see what's really important and what isn't worth worrying about. And the part that makes Paul's words so powerful here, that as he looked back over his life, uh, he realized uh, there wasn't nothing important then uh, as it is to what to come. Uh. So all I want to say to you today is, uh, so long, Kevin, uh, God rest your soul. Uh, you may not have a star uh, on the walk of faith, uh, but uh, you got a star. Uh, that's written in glory. Uh, although your name uh, may not be all uh, over the world, uh, but you got a new name uh, that's written in glory. Uh, oh, Kevin, uh, sleep on my brother uh, and take your rest. Uh, we all love you, uh, but God loves you the best. Uh, is there anybody here? No. Uh, that one day uh, that the Lord is coming back. Uh, I wish I had two or three witnesses in the room uh, that can say, I know uh, that he's coming back. Uh, and one of these old days, uh, I don't know when uh, and I don't know where, uh, but one of these days, uh, I'm going to stand uh, on my pisco uh, lofty highs. Uh, I'm going to view my home uh, and take my flight, uh, this robe of flesh, uh, I'ma drop and rise uh, to seize uh, the everlasting prize uh, and shout while passing uh, through the air. Farewell, uh, that's what Kevin did the other day. Uh, he said, Farewell, uh, I'm going where the wicked uh, shall cease from troubling uh, and the weary will be at rest. Uh, I'm going. See Jesus. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that's going to be with Jesus? Anybody here looking for that great day when the Lord Himself shall descend down with a shout, with the voice of the God in the trump, the voice of God, the trump of the archangel? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with them forever in the air. Kevin, this is your final curtain call. You have done your best. You've done your job. Let everybody stand now and give Kevin that last final applause for a job well done. you my brother you made it home god bless you and now if the funeral directors would come forth to god be all the glory for the great things he has done
if some uh, persons can come forward and and uh, be flower bearers and uh, as we get ready to uh, process out. Amen. This has been a wonderful celebration of life. A wonderful, wonderful time we've had in recognizing, honoring my brother Kevin. To God be the glory. As we leave this place, as we line up to go down to Resurrection Cemetery, please put your flashing lights on as we uh, follow each other because we do know that there will be some traffic. So we want to make sure that we all stand in line and, and we be able to process down uh, accordingly. Uh, Thank you. For the benefit of those of you who may not be going to the cemetery, everyone, please stand, including the family, please stand for the pronouncement of the benediction for the benefit of those who did not. Let me say this right quick, and I forgot in my haste to go to my seat. I did not get a chance to offer the invitation for somebody to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. I just want to take this opportunity. If you're not saved, get, get to know Jesus. Get to know Jesus. Talk to anybody here at this church or bump into me about the plan of salvation. And we'll share it with you because we want everybody to be saved. I don't want nobody to go to hell. I don't want nobody to go to hell. So if you don't know Jesus, get to know Jesus. Ask anybody at this church or anybody that you know that's saved how to be saved and we'll share the plan of salvation with you. Let's look to the Lord. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord live his kindness upon thee and give thee peace. Henceforth, now and forevermore, until we meet again, let the church say, Amen.
tears of sorrow are seen every day, Lord. We know they are, but no sickness, no sighing forever. Oh, no, I've gone the last mile of the way. Yes.